because I was, let's say, 16 and I was willing to save the world. But, but I said to myself, you know what? Just try. If I'm the smartest guy in a room, that's the wrong room. Before you get the promotion, you already need to be that guy. I do this. I want this. I'm already doing this. Give it to me. I was this sort of Greek philosopher who was thinking, hmm, what's my purpose? What's my mission? What am I doing here? You don't know how to do this. Meet people who know how to do this. Okay, guys, so welcome to Under Startups Podcast. So today we have a guest, uh, Havanas, which surname I cannot pronounce. So maybe it's you can... It's all right, man. It's all right. <laughs> so maybe you can tell Nobody me. Nobody can. <laughs> can you pronounce your surname? Of course. My surname is Mojitarian. So good luck with that. So yeah, it's uh, Mojito something. <laughs> mojito. Yeah, Mojito. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right, man. Okay, so you're a learning enthusiast, a Correct. passionate about human development. Yeah. And at the moment, you're a training team leader at Danske Bank. Yes, that is correct. Okay, great. So I want to ask you, I think, one of the most important questions. What made you the person you are today? What made, I mean, there, there, there's so many things but that have made me. Maybe we could go through, like, from your, from, 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 from your past, from your, just from those uh, early years. What was the main things that led you to the path and led you to the place you are today? Uh, you mean career-wise? Uh, you know, some, so, somebody has career events, somebody has life yeah. events, somebody has psychological traumas. It's just, it's, it varies. Sure, sure. So, I mean, in terms of, let's say, speaking about my career. So, I uh, graduated from ISM in 2013 as my okay. bachelor because I initially came to study in ISM because I was, let's say, 16 and I was willing to save the world. So, I said, you know what, let me study politics, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I finished So, that. you came 16? 16, I came to ISM. Okay. I, I just finished my school a little bit earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So I came to Lithuania in 2009. I studied four years economics and politics. Okay. And then I didn't know what to study else. I didn't know what to do. I said, screw it. Let me try master's as well, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I went to like a master's program and I did it for two years. And then it was like a double degree, you know? So yeah. one year here, one year in Norway. And when I just started, they said like, so you got to have your average grade of like 8.5. And it was finance. It was freaking hard. Mm -hmm. And I thought like, oh, I'll never make it. You know, mm -hmm. 8.5. Yes, but, but I said to myself, you know what? Just try. I mean, <laughs> what do you have to lose? Like, you know what? Yeah, maybe you'll never make it, but who cares? You know, okay. at least you'll give it a try. And then somehow it happened. And I was 8.8. .8. I don't know. It was uh, surprising even to me. And then I kind of I uh, I left to Norway for my uh, for my double degree. Well, that was a truly you know a, a, an absolutely incredible experience that I had there. And uh, interestingly, like you know, like in 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 ISM, you you meet very kind of similar people. And uh, especially like so so my grades were quite good. And I thought like you know what whatever. So uh, I'm good, you know. Mm -hmm. And I went to ISM and, uh, and 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 I'm sorry and I and I went to BI like in Norway, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody's grades, grades were great, you know? So I felt like, okay, I have like a billion things to learn. And it was truly motivating, right? I really felt like the importance of other people and how much they shape you, you know, how much they, they make you think and they make you different and, and how much of their influence, positive or negative, uh, you truly feel. But so there is a saying that yeah. you should be, it's better to be the worst out of the best Absolutely. than to be the best out Absolutely. of the worst. That is so true. For example, like uh, if I'm the smartest guy in a room, that's the wrong room, right? I, I would yeah, like you to should, be, you should change the room. Yeah, I would, <laughs> like, I would like to be the stupidest guy in a room okay. because then I can have people whom I can learn. And that's actually how I usually choose my friends or the people I associate with mm -hmm. is like what I admire about this person, you know? What, what, is it, what is it that I can learn from him, you know? And okay. then I, I try to associate with these people because I think people are the best way to learn something, you know? But we have, as I saw through your uh, uh, social medias, we have some similar friends. For example, yeah. uh, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, yeah. Arnoldas. So, yeah. yeah, we're good fellows with him. Yeah. And also, Zygmunt Zabieta. Yeah, yeah. He was a Team European Youth member. Correct. So, he's alumni. He was even a guest lecturer at our entrepreneurship course. Just yeah. For another flow. Oh, yeah, yeah. Not, not yeah. for me, but no. uh, I was also as a member of the Team European uh -huh. Youth. But so we are on the different timelines, okay. but we had a celebration one time when all the generations mm -hmm. met. So we met with him, a pretty interesting guy. What yeah, I he is, tell he is, is, he is, he's, he's, uh, I think after he hmm. went to the, one of the best hackathons in the world. Do you know about more about it? Because he was, uh, he was, uh, I was reading his post in LinkedIn around his hackathon yeah. that shaped him and now he's creating businesses. 
business yeah, yeah, around yeah. that. So, so, so he, he, he told a lot about it when he, when he was presenting himself uh -huh. during, during kind of our, our lecture. Yeah, currently in English, actually recently he won a Startup Accelerator. So that so one, he yeah, was it able was to, yeah. It was a hackathon, then Startup Accelerator or something around that. Yeah, yeah, he was able to really come up with something uh, okay. incredible and then he received funding for that. So that's actually like also, also yeah. like a part of that. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to yeah. your life. So, so going back to my life, and I think that okay, and then and then basically what happened? So I I finished BI right, uh -huh. and I was like, wow, I'm full of power, I'm a Superman, you know. And then I said, okay, let me let me find a job now. So I kind of easily found a job in Lithuania. In no way it wasn't so easy. So I kind of moved mm -hmm. to Lithuania, and I had this job where I was actually uh, I was in sales, and there was. A market research company, well, Euromonitor International, that was like a market research company where I was part of. And then I was so full of it. Right? I was so full of energy and like confidence, you know, because uh, I don't know, maybe my mother used to tell me all the time that I'm the best. So I actually, <laughs> I actually thought that. You believe that. I really believe that. And so when I came in, like my first question at Euromonitor was like, what is the sales record? Mm -hmm. I'm going to break it, right? So that was like my attitude. Did, and you, then, do well, Did you do it? Half a year have passed, and like, well, I, I'm there. I'm kind of doing a normal job, but I didn't break any sales record. Okay. I didn't do anything that spectacular. I'm just kind of guy who works there. Everything mm -hmm. is fine. But yet somehow I'm disappointed, you know? So I stayed, I stayed, here, I, I stayed there for around one and a half years, and then I thought to myself, ah, you know what? I don't know. This is not going anywhere. I need something smarter you know so i need something more interesting you know something something really challenge me because other sales is maybe not intellectual you know that's why it is not like this okay so i changed to financial consulting you know i went there was this management consulting company civita mm. and so and and i changed there because i wasn't let's say patient enough right so i was willing to conquer the world in like five minutes right and of course that like never happens right you need to put in the effort and so but anyway so i changed to i changed to civita and uh, in Civita, it was very interesting, right? So I think it was the, I got fired in like less than three months, you know? <laughs> Why? So, because I was a terrible worker, right? I was, I was super unmotivated. Everything, uh -huh. everything would just, I will do everything with mistakes. Mm -hmm. Nothing would go right. Not a single project that I did went right. Everything was going just terribly. And then eventually on my, on, on, the, on the day I was fired, so uh, the partner was this this uh, this, this guy was, was talking to me and he, and he said something like, "So I feel like you you know I'll be doing you a favor you know like mm -hmm. I think you understand and I understand that this is really not your place," and I I, I agreed with him. I was like, "Yeah, this is totally you know not my place," mm -hmm. and I was unemployed for eight months. And what did you? Do? It was terrible. Like I was I was depressed. I okay. Was, and what did you do through those eight months? So I did not know what to do because I was, let's say, I lost my job okay. and uh, everything was going terribly. You know, wow. I got sick also, everything. I got, I got depressed, right? So I had, I had two months of depression and uh, yeah, things were just terrible. And then mm -hmm. at some point I said, you know what? Let me, uh, let me go. And, and, and then there was this, this job offered, right? This job was in customer service in, in booking.com, mm -hmm. customer service. So I said, okay, you know what? Um, I never liked customer service, and this is totally, I'm never going to do it for life because mm -hmm. I'm better than that. That's what I thought before that. But I said, okay, I'll give it a try. And then I came into Booking.com as customer service. And then when I came in, I was already unemployed for eight months. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, you know what? I mean, this is maybe not the, the dream job of my life, but, you know, I come here to work every single day and like all I want to do is go back to sleep and uh, feel like I've done something meaningful. I've done something important mm -hmm. and I, I don't have a plan. I don't have a five-year plan of what I want to be of what I want to achieve, mm -hmm. but I have today. And today I want to do the best that I can and like that's all I do. And so I did that for three months and then my results were incredible. As a newbie, I had one of the highest productivity in the entire team. And then basically what came up after three months was, so a job position open, it was the position of a trainer. And they said, okay, I, I said, you know what? I'm, you know, now have this philosophy of that I wanna take everything from today and today mm -hmm. I have this job offering of trainer. I said, the hell, let me take it. 
and uh, basically I had before that I was I was teaching English uh, mm -hmm. to 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 uh, the Japanese students actually and when I was in BI okay. just just to make some side money and I was also a volunteer English teacher to to some school kids and I said okay and then and that was the experience I never thought would be useful ever in my life that's what got me the job you know I just I had to talk to my team leader five times to get this approved, right? Because mm -hmm. he was saying something like, well, you're working here three months, you know? What do you want from me, man? I said, like, I really want this, and I want it to get done. Maybe you have some tips, okay? You mentioned that you got the job that you yeah. wanted, yeah. the trainer. Yeah. That How did you manage to land it? You persevere, right? You okay. ask him one time. You say, man, I really want this job. Uh -huh. He says, oh, you said, Send me an email. I said, mm -hmm. send him an email. Okay. He didn't reply to that email. I said, what the hell, man? I mean, okay. Mm -hmm. I just go to talk to him again. I said, I sent you the email that you asked me for. I said, okay, uh, send me a message. I'm like, some, some kind of game or something? All right. Mm -hmm. I sent him the message. And again, like, there's nothing consistent going on. I said, this is really weird. Mm -hmm. I've talked to him the third time, the fourth time. And then eventually, I just sat in front of him and I said, look, man, like, are you going to support me or not, you know? Because in Booking.com, basically, to have, to, to apply to a position, you, you, you needed to have the support of your team leader. Okay. So I said, like, are you going to support me or not? I said, what's, what's the problem here? Like, he said, well, you know, I'm not really sure that you can really do it. You know, you, you, you're working here for three months. I said, I'm sure that I can do it, and I want to do it. Mm -hmm. Support me. Are you going to do this or not? And he said, okay, I'll, I'll support you. So I, I guess the, the thing was that I asked a lot of times and it was really forceful and I never expected the promotion to just land on my shoulders like a grace of God. I said, this is what I want and this is what I'll take. I'm coming for this and I don't wait, I don't wait anybody to give me anything. If I want it, I really go for it and I will put all the efforts that I can to take it. So I think that was, I was really determined to take it and I wouldn't stop at any cost. So that was my... Okay, but if you want, a, if you really want a job position, yeah? Yeah. Is it good to have some creative approaches to get that. For example, creative to land approaches. a job. Yeah, for anything. Creating videos, uh, like s bringing a big poster next to their offices, mm. or something like that. It really depends on kind of what kind of a job okay. do you want to acquire, right? So what kind of skills would they need? Mm -hmm. But of course, let's say one of the best things you can do is that before you get the promotion, you already need to be that guy, you know? Yeah. You know what I mean? So if when before I became the trainer, actually, yeah, good, good that you mentioned. Before I became the trainer, I was already doing trainings in my team. Mm -hmm. So when I was asking for that position, I already said, guys, actually, I'm already doing this, right? So... And this was one of the best uh, advices that I received from my managers. So back in the days, my, my unsuccessful days at this <laughs> consulting company, I asked my manager, I said, so how do I become, uh, how do I get the position of a senior consultant? He said, well, it's very easy. You first need to become one, right? Okay. So, so that's kind of also part of the trick. If you want to get a promotion, then, and if you want to be a team leader, then mm -hmm. you've got to start doing leadership stuff. If you want to be a trainer, you've got to start training people. Mm -hmm. If you want to do some, if you want to be a creative, you know, you've got to start creating things. Mm -hmm. So you start with yourself, and then you see where this move, uh, you know. But you never wait for the manager to come to pat you on the back and to say, you know what, Benedictus, you're such an incredible guy. You really, you're, you're really going to get this promotion. Like, no, I do this. I want this. I'm already doing this. Give it to me. Okay. That's, that's the only approach I see, and that's kind of the most, that's like the strongest way to go versus waiting for other people to give you something or not give you something. That's, that's, I think that's a great idea here. It's just, I have some many thoughts about that, but no. I think that's, that's a great approach to become the man that you want to be. Correct. So, or fake it till you make it. In a way, you're not because kind of really faking it, but you're, but you're gaining not the experience. That in, in yeah, so you're but, but you're gaining the traction. Uh -huh. And at the point where you, when you do your ask, when you do your pitch, when you say, yeah. I want to become a trainer, I want to become the team leader, you say, look, man, I'm already doing all this, mm -hmm. all right? So what is your reason for rejecting me? And then they don't have a lot of reasons, right? Because they clearly see that you are this guy. That's a great approach. Yeah, I, I, yeah I'll, just, I'll definitely agree with you all at right. this point. Okay, but... You're a trainer now. Yes, yeah. I, I'm. I, I I lead a team of trainers. Okay, you're a team leader now. Okay, you were a trainer. Now yes. you're a team leader. Yeah, and also you're teaching entrepreneurship in ISM. Yes, here. you have teach now taught. Yes, you have taught now. Now, because yeah. 
already your lectures have passed. Yeah. So I'll ask you one question. Yeah. Can you train entrepreneurial mindset? Can you train entrepreneurial mindset? Uh, yes, you can. And I think maybe as, as a trainer, basically, you, you cannot really... So, so are you talking from a position of a trainer or from a position of a person? No, from, from position of a trainer, from position of an expert here. Just, for example, my, my main approach is mm -hmm. here and my, my main idea is to grab the tips from you. Yeah. How to become more entrepreneurial. Uh -huh. How to become more an entrepreneurial. entrepreneurial? Yes. So I think a big part of being an an an, an entrepreneur, or if you are training somebody to, to have this entrepreneurial mindset, and they don't have that, then you have to kind of constantly challenge them, mm -hmm. right? Regarding all of these things that they are depriving themselves mm -hmm. of. So, for example. Entrepreneurs must learn to have a positive mindset. And mm -hmm. positive mindset doesn't mean that you're happy all the time. Positive mindset is that means that you're fixed on solving problems. You're not looking for a problem for every solution. You're looking for a solution for every problem. That's mm -hmm. what positive mindset is. And so as an entrepreneur, that's what drives your entrepreneurship. You see a problem and then you think, okay, how can I solve this? How can I do this? How can I do, how can I do this better than that guy? You know. Mm -hmm. So positive mindset is such an important approach that you can gain and 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 another one i think and, and this goes without saying is of course is, is trying to be creative right it's trying mm -hmm. to do something that um other people haven't thought of but but that's not always necessary right you can just copy the business and then and then you can still be okay with that because there is there there might be enough market for for uh for everyone right mm -hmm. and and then and then i would say then then Another one, and this is a very important part of the uh, entrepreneurship mindset, is to understand that uh, you need to take risks, right? Okay. That life is full of risks and you accept them. And life is extremely uncertain, but you accept that. You don't know what the hell will happen tomorrow, but you do today what you can do today. And then tomorrow flows as it flows. You prepare for it. You do build your plans, but as you move into the world of entrepreneurship versus the world of employment, where you get your salary every month, where you have a quarterly plan from your manager, right, or, or, or an annual you know, development plan. When you're an entrepreneur, things are burning right now. You have to solve them. You cannot plan to do this one year later, right? So, so you have to solve the issues that you're facing today. So entrepreneurship mindset is very much, and that is one of the biggest differences between having a corporate job and being an entrepreneur is that when you're an entrepreneur, you need to be right here, right now. There's no time to wait. And you have to work today, and then tomorrow will bring whatever tomorrow brings. You don't know what it'll be, but you just hopeful it will be good. You have this belief, this inner belief that things will turn out well. And, and you just have to be prepared that they might not. But at the same time, this does not stop you from doing whatever mm -hmm. you're doing today. So I would say maybe these are the three cornerstones in my, uh, in my understanding of an entrepreneurship mindset. Yeah, I'm just thinking and it's, it's, that's, 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 that's very eye-opening here. Oh. Yeah, I'm just I'm thinking about entrepreneurship because you know, a lot of people thinking that entrepreneurship is the same as business. No, but it's it's, it's, it's not. It, but it's a completely different thing. Correct, correct. Entrepreneurship is not just about opening your own startup. That you can do that. But yeah. to be an entrepreneur, you don't necessarily have to own a business, you know? Entrepreneurial mindset, you can have an entrepreneurial mindset within a corporation. Of right? course. As that the there's a a uh, special term for that, inter... Intrapreneurship, intrapreneurship, right? intrapreneurship. Yeah. For example, Gmail okay. was found because of intrapreneurship. Somebody came up with that idea in Google on his own free time, and mm -hmm. he thought, you know what, what the hell, let's try this out. No manager gave him a task to come up with a Gmail, right? He came up with it himself, and he created that. So that was created in this... and Because, because Google has this special 20% of time. So in Google, 20% of the time, you can do whatever you want. You can work anything work-related. You can do whatever you want to do. Marketing, do marketing. But do this finance, is such do a good finance. approach. So, so in, yeah, and in Google, they have 20% of the time. Do whatever you want, man. So, so, and then that's where all of their great and incredible solutions eventually come I from. I think that's how innovations come. That's how innovations, you cannot, for, it's very difficult to force innovation. Yeah. To make you think that you need to come up with a specific solution. But then when you're on, on your off time, you're just bouncing ideas with some guys, that's when something can spark and something can happen. But for that, you need to just 
take a proactive approach and, and be really mm -hmm. the one who says, like, I have this limited time. What is it that I, I can do with my time today? And then we'll see where this takes me tomorrow. So that's, and you can accept this uncertainty of life. You accept this uncertainty, these risks, but then you become stronger when you do that. You're not shielding yourself from all this uncertainty. You accept it and you move with it. And that's part of, I, I believe, what makes entrepreneurs so crazy mm -hmm. and also, but also the people who bring so much value. Let's talk more about risks. Let's yeah. elaborate there. You started taking risks for from an early age. Yes. Because you had not one, not two, but a couple businesses. Yes. Yeah. Can you tell us more about ideas? My businesses? Had? Okay. Yeah, start from the first one. Most of them were failed, right? But yeah. fair enough. Yeah. Yes. So so my, 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 my first business, and this is, of course, very interesting because I'm kind of go going to uh, admit to a small crime. <laughs> <laughs> But one of them was that I was uh, I was taking alcohol from uh, from Lithuania, and then I was selling it in 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 Belarus because in Belarus it was cheaper uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. So 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 yeah. So so we would we would take this. We would take. I, I took one two bottles there, and then I, I kind of sold it to uh, in in mm. Belarus. But then very quickly I realized this is not a very sustainable business, right? <laughs> like it's really not. not. <laughs> it's really not. I said maybe this is not the best idea. Uh -huh. But this is the first time I saw it. Like okay, so this so, so it was not very well th thought through. But I was let's say 16 years old. So what can you expect? Mm. And then my second uh, business idea was when I came to ISM, mm. and I said, you know what? Uh, you need students, and mm -hmm. I can bring you students. Okay. I want you to pay me for that, right? And initially, they, they thought like, uh, no. I mean, some people do that for free. I said, oh, really? How successful are they? And then they said, okay. And then I had some people, you know, to talk for me, and then kind of this happened. And so they kind of agreed that they are going to that that I will help them to bring students mm -hmm. uh, from from Belarus, from 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 Armenia, and then yeah. Uh, we tried doing that, so I was not alone. I was with my uh, partner, but it didn't work. It didn't work. Okay. The main reason it didn't work is that we didn't put the work. We didn't follow through. This all was an incredible idea. We even created a website, okay. but we didn't really follow through. Mm -hmm. We didn't really put in the work for that. We didn't fully believe in this idea. It's more like I did it, but I was like, yeah, you know what, let's try. But I wasn't really trying. I wasn't really invested in that and I think a biggest problem was that I didn't invest money in it you know we created a very cheap website and so part of me was like oh this is so cool I'm free I didn't invest I didn't but then also the problem is that you also didn't commit you know mm -hmm. you didn't commit so I think this is a great learning is that whenever you bring anyone in your business any team member However small the investment is, like make them invest. Don't make them risk free, because then they're not gonna do anything. It's just like in poker. When yeah. you play poker, you have to play with your money. Because yeah. if you're not playing with money, then you don't care. Then yeah, then you don't care, and you can uh, all in Absolutely anything. Absolutely true. And when you're playing just with small uh, sums, for example, five euros, Absolutely it's true. a completely different game. Correct. When when you play poker without money, right? People don't care. It's not a very interesting game. Yeah. All of a sudden, if it's a very little amount of money, then everybody's focused, you know, of playing course. on their best, not talking, not not trash talking, talking not, not trash talking, yeah. yeah, trying to yeah. So 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 more or less the same happens mm -hmm. in business, you know. Yeah. I completely agree with you yeah. here. All right. <laughs> so, okay, let's let's analyze your failures. And th and then I had the watch business actually. Oh, you had one more business. I had, okay. I had one more business. I had I had the watch business, and this came actually before my job at Booking.com. So and it was right during those eight months. During those eight months. So basically, what happened? It was the 100th anniversary of Lithuania. Okay. And I thought, oh, so it was a 2011. It was a 2018. Wait, 100 years. Oh, Wait, no, 2011 was 1,000 years yes. for the mentioning of the yeah, name yeah. Lithuania, okay. 2018 from, 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 from 1918. Uh -huh. And so my thought was like this, you know, let me make 100 watches to, commemor to commemorate 100 years of, of Lithuania, okay. right? So I had everything set up. I had, uh, I had a watch factory okay. who produced this for me. And okay. it was just because this guy was my friend. He was like the head of the factory. He said, no problem, we can do this, man. Yep. And so I had, he gave me designers... I collected like a team of digital marketers. I had a I had a lady who was running like a fashion journal, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was supposed to be great, but then it 
you know, it never came to life. I produced just a very small batch for myself and to test it out. And nobody liked it. it. That's it. No, it's not that nobody liked it. Again, I didn't follow through. And again, the reason was that I wasn't putting any of my money into this, right? Okay. The, all the risks were bared by the factory. All the risks were bared by anybody else. And the same was with my team, right? They were not really, they, they were not invested in this project. Mm-hmm. And like the second thing was that I started this business, but I knew nothing about watches. I knew nothing about digital marketing. I knew nothing about any of these concepts, right? Which I think just tells you that, you know, whenever you're starting something, I mean, you can research that, you know, or if you, or you need to bring somebody who's really experienced in that business mm-hmm. to help you out in that. So, so that's, you know, but, but you, you, you do need to have some, some experience, some expertise, uh, to bring this project uh, okay. to life. Let's talk m- more about failing. Yeah. Do you think failing is normal? Because in our in this society, usually we talk about failing as a bad thing, and we talk that you shouldn't fail. You should failing be successful. Failing is necessary. But yeah, let's talk more about it. Failing is failing is so be, in, in in the very beginning you asked me but what shaped me. But how to fail me. like a pro? So in 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 <laughs> in the very beginning you asked me what shaped my life the most, and these were the failures. Okay. These were the moments where I learned the most in my entire life. So mm-hmm. these were the failures. When I lost my job, when I when I when I when I lost, you know, so, so this brought me the most understanding of my work life, right? Uh-huh. When I so all those kind of girlfriends that I lost, that they brought the most understanding about myself and about <laughs> relationships, right? All those friendships I Definitely. lost or the problems that I had with my friends brought me the most understanding about friendships and about relationships with people. You never learn as much from victory as much you learn from failure. Failure is not only, uh, it, it is necessary for you to succeed, like you must have failure. And I think the most important thing about mistakes is not whether you make mistakes or not. And this is what I keep telling to my team, for mm-hmm. example. I tell them, guys, it's not about whether you made a mistake. It's about that you don't repeat the same mistake two times. So that you learn from your mistakes. We talk a lot about learning from other people's mistakes. That's great, but people don't really learn like this. You, know? you would learn something, but you would never learn as much from other people's mistake as much as you would learn from your own mistakes. I'm now so thinking you about my own out, life here. You gotta Just go out there, <laughs> Make mistakes, make failures, fail many, many times, uh-huh. and then really grow out of that and become a better person. Yeah, as I said, I'm just thinking now about my own okay. life, about their relationships, about everything. I just, and now I'm thinking that the, all the lessons that I've learned were, came from failures. Yes. I don't remember things from my successes, from my victories, but the, all the things that touched me the most were definitely failures here. Correct. But why don't we educate people to fail? Why don't why don't we have it in our educational system I that failure would be normalized here? I think our our uh, well, at least the 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 generation of my parents, right? They were very protective of their children. So let me protect my children so that you know nothing happens to them, so that they're good. Kind of out of their best interest, they really try to protect their children. But that was the impact of the Soviet Union, I think. Here, the Soviet mentality. Uh, could be, could be, but I think that, that, but then eventually what is achieved is that, you know, and, and in any kind of, look, so mm-hmm. for your muscles to become stronger, you need to, uh, you need to expose them to stress, right? Of course. You need to train them. Then, then there is some, 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 some uh, destruction in your muscle tissue, yeah. but then it grows it together. Re- it regenerates and, and it gets bigger. And your muscle becomes stronger, right? Yeah. And the same is everywhere, right? So basically you need to put something into stress for it to become stronger. And so that's, that's, that's what, what people are. They need to be exposed to stress to be better. And if you shield a person, then it be, he becomes or she becomes weak, mm-hmm. right? So, so you don't need to shield your children. You, need to, you, you don't need to fully just let them jump off the cliff. But, so but they need to take calculated risks, but they need, to, they need to take risks, sometimes stupid risks as well. But you cannot... But if you try to shield them, then they then they grow weak, right? So so your children have to have to be exposed to difficulties, have to exposed to hardships, have to fail, have to have to have to yeah, something has to break yeah, in yeah. them to grow back. There's no other mm-hmm. way about it. There is a concept of there's playground concept. I've read about it a couple of years ago, I think. Uh, there's you know there's how how could you imagine a playground? Usually it's very safe. 
Yeah. Yeah. You have a lot of safety precautions here. Yeah. But there is a playground concept where it's, def- it's not safe. It has just a lot of parts that are just different parts, uh, different uh, pieces of wood, nails yeah. and everything for the children to learn. Correct. To play with that. Correct. And just to learn that that's... Not everything is good. Absolutely, and that that you could try and find from those things. Absolutely, just, and I think that's that's how we should shape our educational system to make more risks, to, to make more, to, to fail more. Absolutely, because you you know what happens when you when you don't fail. Okay. Uh, then when you fail, uh-huh. then you're hit in your face with a shovel and you don't know what to do. Uh-huh. You're like, oh, but I was this perfect kid. I was this perfect guy. I mean, so what's happening? But I'm I'm now a failure. Mm-hmm. So the people who have never dealt with failure have no idea how to deal with that feeling. Mm-hmm. They're completely broken. It throw the it throws them into into this vicious circle, right? So, so how do they get out of there? Any you know? But but if they have failed many times, they had made mistakes. If it hurt them, mm-hmm. now all of a sudden they have this resistance. They have this they have this strength in them. To, to, to resist all these difficult sufferings that are coming their way. Because the amount of sufferings as you grow, it doesn't decrease. It actually increases. It's mm-hmm. just that you become stronger so that you, you can take more of that suffering, right? It, it's never less. It's never mm-hmm. becoming easier ever. It's mm-hmm. only becoming harder the older mm-hmm. you get. But as it becomes harder, you also become stronger. Mm-hmm. But if you don't become stronger, then it will just overwhelm you. And at some point in your life, especially when you're out of college, then nobody tells you that you're good anymore. You mm. don't get good grades. And yeah, and actually nobody cares about your grades. Just if you can't deliver the result, then sorry, goodbye. No, I... And then this, this is completely kind of, you know, this is a very difficult a pill to swallow for a lot of young people who were shielded all their life and have been told that they're great and they're wonderful and they're incredible and just because they got they got good grades oh my god you're so talented you know and they go into the world and they understand oh wait a second talent is not enough you know i really got to put in the hard work but yeah you, there's a dull saying like from existentialist Friedrich Nietzsche uh what doesn't kill us make, make us, us stronger, stronger. yeah Correct. and that's i think that would be the main concept of startups here Correct, correct. So there is a, a, a thought okay. that most startups are like 18, 19, 20-year-old guys, right? But then if you would look at the number of successful startups, mm-hmm. a lot of the successful startups happen after 30, you know? Okay. Because people have failed through their time. When I actually, it's very funny, when I started my business about these watches, okay. right? I called my aunt, who is, a, who is an entrepreneur, and she said, uh, so which time are you starting your business. I said, well, Aunt, you know, this is like the second time. I said, okay, all right. She said, um, so what about your previous times? I said, I failed. She said, okay, so, but did you go bankrupt? I said, well, no. She said, okay, so uh, call me when it happens, you know? But that's where the term serial entrepreneur comes into play. That's where serial entrepreneur, because she went bankrupt a couple of times, actually. Mm-hmm. She, had, she, had, she had miserable failures until she was able to build a great business mm-hmm. out of nothing, you know? And so, and so that's like part of it. I think that's what entrepreneurship really is. But let's look to the other side. There is also some success stories that made it from the first time. For example, you Deliveroo. You can be lucky, yeah. Yeah, can, there's yeah. Deliveroo. You know Deliveroo? Deliveroo founder. It's, I think, one of the most popular okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. billion-dollar valued business yeah. in America, uh, which de- delivers food to your, yeah. to your place. So Deliveroo founder, he, he was so invested in the idea after he started working at the, an office. And office workers had their allowance for lunch and for dinner. They would go always to the supermarket to buy food. And he was so convinced that his idea was great. So he, made, he, was, he went all in into that idea, and it was the only idea that he ever tried to do business, and he succeeded there. Okay. So there's also an aspect, aspect of is, luck there. There is, there is 100% the aspect of luck, okay. right? 100%. But the thing is that you cannot just hope for luck, you know? So, so that, that's, that's like part of this positive mindset mm-hmm. and, and, and the belief that eventually you have is like you do good things, for yourself, you do good things for your business, and yeah, I mean, sometimes you are totally unlucky, but, it's, but also sometimes uh-huh. you are lucky. So I think with time, as you do the same thing, eventually there is enough probability for you to catch the luck, and then you catch it. But, but it's you don't just know like when. in poker. Yes. It's you can play, 
You yeah. can you can win some place just by luck. There you go. But at the end of the game, at the end of the game, at the end of the day, yeah, it's hundred percent, hundred percent skill. Correct. So you might win a couple of hands yeah, by playing by yeah. stupidly, of course, and just have stupid luck. But at the end of the time, the, but when you play the poker for a longer time, yeah. then you realize that luck just you know that's only skill there. That's it's eventually skill. Exactly. So there you go. Okay, let's jump to very different experience yeah. that we are in common, both of us. Yeah. It's stand up. Yes. So, could you tell us more how you started in stand up? So, uh, I basically, so, well, I was never part of, let's say, an official stand up club, but I became part of this Toastmasters, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's actually, so, you know, when you, when you grow up, there's a lot of things that you don't know about yourself. Yeah. And actually, so, so, so because you are subjected to only specific environment, mm -hmm. and then you, you don't realize that this environment has a gigantic influence on you that you don't even understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, your genes are turning on and turning off based on your environment where you're in. You can literally be a different person within a different environment. It has a lot of influence on your psyche. Okay, so having said that, so I told you, right, that I was fired from my yeah. previous company. And then when I went to Booking.com, I was thinking a lot about what has changed. Apart from my mindset that I want to succeed every day, what has also changed was the environment mm -hmm. where they said, you know what, Hovana is like, if you want to fail, go ahead and do that, man. Like, it's okay. Like, just, just try. Try your best. Whatever happens, man, it's okay. Like, we have you back. And I said, oh, you know what? Okay, this is great. And they said, and we treat you as a human being. Like, you're not a resource that, that we're going to squeeze. You're a human being. You're a person, and you have your own life goals, and that's okay. We just give you a platform for you to realize your potential. And, and, and I was surrounded by people who motivated me and who inspired me. And when I realized that, 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 that this environment helped me to succeed, environment of psychological safety, environment where I could fail and where I could rely on others and they were not my enemies and they're not gonna put knives in my back. And I realized, wow, this is how I succeeded. And that's part of the reason I became the team leader, right? To, to make everyone's life mm -hmm. so that they can succeed, so to create that safety, so that it's okay to make mistakes. So what I'm saying then also about stand-up, how I kind of, it's a long segue to that, yeah. <laughs> but so, I never thought of myself as a creative person, ever. Me too. Okay. And, then, <laughs> and, then, and then at some point I said, okay, you know what? Because I was always part of this, you know, so I was studying economics, then finance, then working in finance. This, you know, like a creative accountant is not somebody you're looking forward to meet, but right? I couldn't agree more to you. Let, let me interrupt yeah. you for yeah. a second. I was, I think from when I started in high school, no, before that, like my parents always told me, you're gonna, you're going to be an, uh, inter you're gonna study IT. Yeah, you're gonna be you go. an IT. You're gonna be a programmer. Yeah, that's there you it. Go. Which and is yeah, and I was focused to that from I think from twelve maybe yeah. around that. Since I, w I know how to program. Yeah, I know C plus plus. I've yeah. learned a couple more programming languages, and I was doing that until the, I think when I was the breakthrough. Maybe at 11th grade, yeah. at 16, 17, something around that, that I understood that, fuck, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I don't want to do this. Yeah, I'm, I I'm, don't want to do this. I'm more of a leader there. there I'm, you I'm go. more of a creative person. There you go. I started doing stand up. I started creating some dumb shit. Yeah. I started just creating. I was all in. I was starting pitching, doing uh, public speakings. And that's where my creativity just came to life. Yeah. When I, when I just killed that idea that I would be a programmer. Correct. So, and, and you have to metamorphose, right? You have to change your essence from time to time to, to give out your identity yeah. and assume kind of like a new identity, right? And then you just constantly keep discovering things about yourself that you didn't know about. Mm -hmm. And when I started to do this, I became part of this Toastmasters, right? Okay. It's like a public speaking club. Do you do it in Lithuania? In Vilnius? I was doing it. And so I'm not, I'm not really active right now, but, okay. but, but I was doing that. And then, and then I remember at one of the conferences, I was at like this public speaking conferences. Mm -hmm. I was talking to this, to this girl. And then I said something very profound that I only understand kind of a little bit of more now what I said. I said, I'm really, really happy here because I can truly be myself. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, I thought about these words, and I thought, like, what did I mean by this? You know, what do I mean? I can uh, so I cannot be myself anywhere else. 
And then I realized like, but being myself for me, it also meant expressing myself, you know. And stand up meant that I can express my creativity. It was because I never before, I never tried drawing or, or anything like that. I went to musical school, but musical school isn't creative. They tell you, learn this and then yeah. that's it. Don't do anything. Do this, and then it's more like like it's. I've done it too, so I know. <laughs> there's, there's nothing creative about that, and so and so yeah, and so I didn't do creative things, and then uh -huh. when I first tried, I was like, oh my god, I love this. This is incredible. But it's such an adrenaline rush. It is. It is. I can express myself. I can truly tell what I think. And then it just, it just something changed in me. I realized that I actually love creating, and mm -hmm. I love expressing my thoughts in some form, whether it would be a product, whether it will be a service, whether it would be a stand-up comedy, whatever mm. it is. And that has truly changed me. Seeing myself in this new environment, seeing myself like in a, in a completely new place, allowed me to understand that there is more to myself than what I thought. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe I'm not such a strict finance person. Okay. Hmm. Maybe I'm also like a stand-upper. Maybe I'm a creative guy. Maybe then I can also teach, you know, maybe then I can also do some other things. And so this has changed the image of myself because I was in a different thing. I tried something different mm. and then I realized I can succeed in this field where I never thought I will. And then, wow, it's very interesting, you know, that, 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 that I kind of realized this about myself. But stand up, it's, I think it's not for a career, as a career choice, no. is a really bad one. <laughs> it is a terrible one. Yeah, yeah, but as a learning experience for yourself, I think it's. I think every public speaker yeah. should try stand. Correct. Up. It, I think it is the hardest form of public speaking. It's definitely because you have to make hundreds of people laugh, and you're just. I always. I've, I've done it a couple times. Yeah. And when I go to the scene and I, I just mm -hmm. I, I take the step on the stage, I feel naked. Yeah. Like yeah. It, Abs just, absolutely. You everybody are. Everybody's looking you at you. Are. They're just believing that you'll make them laugh like Correct. super fantastically or yep. something around that. And you're just, and sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it doesn't work. It's it, just dead silence. In your silence. mind, it looks like that's, oh, fuck, it will be the best joke that no. I've ever told. You will tell the punchline. Silence. And no one understands it. Silence. Dead silence. But that gives you like the superpower, you know? When you are rejected by hundreds of people, uh -huh. when you, and as you mentioned, when you're like naked on a scene, like when you are rejected, like then... You're never afraid of rejection anymore. So we're like, coming back like, to failures you don't here. Don't care about that anymore. I was rejected already. What does it matter? I already felt this, you know. Like, yeah, I, I failed with this joke miserably. So first three, four, five times it feels terrible, but then at some point you just move on. Like, you understand that 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 it's normal, and, and it after that it's that very much. easy for you. That's it was it. an icebreaker for myself as a public speaker, because after that, go. I could speak about anything. Yep. I could pitch anything as you saw. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah, you did. Yeah, and I could do, just, I could be a way more better public speaker. Correct. Just because I've tried a couple times stand up. Correct, correct. So correct. that's, I think that's a very good courage, uh, courage booster. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so in this podcast, we have one thing that we do with all the guests. Yeah. We try their skills. Yeah. So for you, I think the most dominant skill is public uh, speaking Correct. and storytelling. Yeah. Okay. So we have in such a beautiful exercise here. So okay. uh, I hear I have some words prepared and also I have opened a random word generator. So I think you're familiar with this exercise, which is we're going to start with the first word. You have to tell a story, start telling a story just around that one word. Okay. I'll give you new words. And you have to introduce them to your story. Okay. So we'll make a couple of minutes story just about that to test your skill. You got it. Okay, great. Let's do it. Okay, so the first word is kebab. Kebab. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> kebab. So a story about kebab. Well, I don't know if this is a story about a human or a dog that eventually ended up in a kebab. <laughs> but, but let's assume it is a human being who, 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 who eventually tasted that kebab, right? And so Lighting. I, remember, uh, I remember that actually back in my university days when I was writing a bachelor thesis. So I was, well, I was very hungry at night and I was said uh, nothing was working apart from that kebab shop. And I said... And, and Cactus. Then, and, then, and then back in 
the day, right? So going out at, at night, it was almost like walking on a cactus, you know? So it was like very, very difficult. It was very dangerous. I said, okay, you know what? Banana. Uh, and, and you must be really bananas to just, to just go and just, just, just talk to this, uh, just go at night to the railway Marker. station. Uh, what? Marker. Marker. Yeah, because, you know, like being a foreigner, it's like you're carrying like a marker on your mm -hmm. face, you know, it's like something like that. Colorblind. And what? Colorblind. Yeah, because most people, a lot of people are not colorblind. They totally, totally see your color and like, uh, something is going on. Who is this dude? What are you doing here? You know? But anyway, and, and, and then you try to buy the midnight. kebab. At, the, at midnight, actually, <laughs> right? And actually past midnight, you try to buy that kebab. And then it was very dangerous and I was very Skill. young. Skill. And then I said, okay, so what, what is it that I can use? And I used my creativity skill and I was wearing a mask. And what is a mask? Bitcoin. And, and, I, and I was, and, 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 and then at, at that point, there was something very new. So just like Bitcoin was new in 2017, so, so the, uh, the, the swine flu was, was that kind of a thing, like a new Armani thing jeans. What, that, that was everybody was, was, was talking about, right? It was like the opposite of Armani jeans. Nobody was willing to have that, right? It's like, I don't want the swine flow internet as i was coughing <laughs> as, I was, as i was i was i was coughing so much everybody was just running away from me right running because they were willing to be alone and home i don't know surfing the internet but definitely not being around me tongue what tongue tongue yeah okay <laughs> tongue yeah because you know like because because i don't know like maybe they felt also because because i was speaking like in a different tongue or whatever but, <laughs> and, and i didn't speak their tongue but yeah but but eventually having that mask and then coughing very very loudly during the time of swine flu saved me from all the weird dudes and i was able just to buy my kebab made out of whatever <laughs> i don't want to ask those questions but but i eventually was able to find some food after midnight right so nice you have this stage, a flow stage, when you're in the creative Correct. flow. and you just roll with it. Yeah, that's, I think that's the best thing. And I usually have it um, at such random times. Yeah. The flow stage. For example, I had to write a speech. And I think I was just surfing the web. Or no, I was FaceTiming my friend. It was at 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. And I was just FaceTiming. And she asked me, have you written the speech yet? And I said, no, I'll do it in a couple of days. I'll still have a week. And that's... And just at 1 a.m., I stopped and I said, okay, goodbye. Because <laughs> I just, I had an idea. I jumped mm -hmm. into the flow stage and for three hours yeah, straight, you just, till 4 a.m., I wrote there my you speech. Go. Okay, it, it, it does totally happen sometimes. Yeah, but that's also that this flow stage, to reach this flow stage, it's, I think it's crucial. It is. For a businessman to create ideas. It is. For your business. It is. Maybe have some tips. How do you, because I have my methods, how I get into my flow stage. But maybe you have some tips from your side. Uh, I would say that you prepare yourself to go into flow stage. You can okay. never plan it. You can mm -hmm. never say when it will happen. Mm -hmm. But you condition yourself to be in that flow stage. Mm -hmm. It means that you take care of your life. So you don't have those things that are bothering you. Because, you know, like you think that you don't think about it. You actually think about it. So... You would clean your home, you would clean your, you know, you would, you, you would have your things ready. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have any missed assignments at work or at school mm -hmm. or whatever, right? So you would be internally calm because when you're calm, then you allow yourself to really think and to really be creative. Mm -hmm. I have my, you know, special coffee that I drink that I love that, that really also boosts this creativity. Mm -hmm. And also, peep, because also, let's see, you see, what is also creativity? Creativity is, means that... Uh, having having an idea means that some cells, some neurons in your brain connected, but mm -hmm. what connected with what? For that to connect, you have to expose yourself to various interesting material, to people, uh, to books, to videos, to films, to things. And then once you get into this kind of flow where you are, I don't know, maybe kind of exercising regularly, you have cleaned your home, you have things, you know, you, you're in calm and you're also exposing yourself to these various things. At some point, you're like, hit was like, oh my God, <laughs> oh my God, how this is an incredible idea. Sometimes it can happen, it can, it can happen inside a conversation. You're like, okay. wow. You say, wait a moment. I mean... Oh my, I have to really write this but down. But that's why you should always carry your iPhone or something. Yeah, it to notes, write things that I have such a... Yeah. For example, if I'm... I do it like every 24-7. If, yeah. if I'm having a night out, I would find in my at morning, I would find such a random, 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 random ideas, yeah. the random thoughts in my notepad. And after that, I could make... There could be ideas, stand-up jokes, yeah. anything. And I think that's crucial because you will that never is. know. 
when when you'll jump into flow stage. But there's also some artificial uh, artificial uh, methods to go into the flow stage. LSD? <laughs> no. For example, <laughs> I'll, I'll think about something more, less simpler. For example, showers. Yes, totally, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Show showers. I've, I've read about this theory that uh, to ha get into your flow stage, you should do something mechanical. For example, mm. walking to occupy the to occupy your mind yes. to let the think about the other things. That is that is a So, a for example, walking, showers, uh, cooking for my for me works also hmm, interesting yeah you can actually you can you can do things like that as well i think that that's 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 a pretty interesting mm -hmm. yeah for example when i go to the gym i leave my phone in my locker you all never and it. then and then i just want to be free for huh. that time and then sometimes really cool thoughts also enter into my head or you're absolutely right sometimes they do these long walks and then they're like hmm you know like something strikes in you so you can't say that when, whenever you're doing something let's mm -hmm. say a little bit kind of stable yeah. and then your mind is occupied with something else then you can go through this kind of thoughts uh, as well yeah yeah that's that's i mean i think that's that's that's, that's an interesting, interesting way yeah. of, of of looking at it as well so I, i've had some great ideas in the gym also <laughs> in, in in where in the gym in the, in gym. the gym there you yeah, go yeah definitely okay let's jump to very interesting topic tell me world economic forum yes world economic forum what did you do there what do I do at World Economic Forum? So first forum? of all, let's start from from A because this is around the around the end, okay? Yeah. Because you know you were already in the event. Let's start from the beginning. How did you? What kind of organization were you in yeah. to be? I'm I'm also obviously talking about global shapers. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me more about them. More about global shapers. Yeah, and then let's jump to the World of course. Economic Forum. So, okay, so look, I was living in Lithuania for what? Um, 12 years right now. And then. Wait, wait, wait. Let's, for example. Yeah. Do you know Lithuanian? Uh, I know, yeah, more or less, less or more, however you like, put it. How could you, how could you just describe your level of, it, of Lithuania? I can order a beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can, I can, let's say, maintain a not very kind of. Uh, like, uh, like not very difficult conversation like, hello how are you doing yeah. great thank you great Goodbye. thank you yeah do you speak english thank you <laughs> <laughs> yes nice uh but let's say yeah so i, I live here for for quite a while and then there was this event at uh, global lithuanian leaders okay and then i met this wonderful guy there uh who leo right who was actually who was also um yeah you haven't met him he was teaching for another flow okay so and he was so inviting. He was so nice. And then generally at that event, I met so many incredible people. Mm -hmm. And then I, and I said, Leo, but what do you do? You know, he said like, well, you know what? I'm also part of this global shapers. I said, well, what the hell is uh -huh. global shapers? And then he explained this to me a little bit that, that this is a place where we, don't, we do want to do some public good. We run projects, but this is not charity because here at, 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 at Global Shapers, we try to do something that can live on its own, right? Okay. For example, this project of Women Go Tech, right? Mm -hmm. Which is now, it became a project on its own. It is funded by, 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 by other companies. And it is not like a, just a charity action that we do and then we feel good, mm -hmm. and then, but then it stops. So we try, to, we try to bring people together so that they can continue this project without us. So that's kind of the main idea behind Global Shapers. It is, you can call it social entrepreneurship. Okay. Right? So that you create a project that can generate money, mm -hmm. that, can generate, that can generate ideas, and that can sustain itself at some point without your direct involvement, and that will be your impact. Mm -hmm. And then he invited me for the first meeting of the Global Shapers. And I went there, I was like, oh my God, I've never met this many incredible people in one place <laughs> as I met in Global Shapers. Oh, yeah. Absolutely marvelous guys, right? So, 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 uh, so interesting. So, engineers, uh, lawyers, so, 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 space engineers. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, wow. Lithuania has space engineers. Yeah, wow. it, it, was, it was incredible. Like, so, so, programmers. It was like, wow, this is like, I mean, really, I mean, if people from all walks of life, digital marketing, uh -huh. banking. And I was like, this is really, really incredible. Doctors. I was like, wow. I mean, I, I'm now exposed to so, such interesting people. And I can talk about anything in mm -hmm. my life. And they would be able to sustain that conversation. And, I, and that, was, that was the place where I truly felt that I'm accepted. And I truly felt that I belong to that mm -hmm. place. And that gave me such a warm feeling. And then 
And then at some point, let's say, I said, you know what, I really like this place and I really like these people that are, that are in it, so why don't I become the curator of the hub and I will take care of these people because I do want to give back. And, and I do want to accept that responsibility. And so, and so that, that's how I became like this curator of this, of this uh, global shapers. Uh, yeah, because, because it was, that, that, that's what they said, you know, Hovannes, do you want to be the curator? Mm -hmm. I said, I think this is a, a great idea. And then yes, I would, I would love to. And so global shapers, as if we talk about this organization, I talk about what they do, but also they're part of this World Economic Forum, okay. right? So, and World, it's kind of like the youth wing of World Economic Forum. So to join global shapers, you have to be below 27. You have to be a guy who's kind of, in a way, entrepreneurial, right? Mm -hmm. Who cares about the society, who wants to do something more than just him, who wants to, who wants to bring some good to life and to other people. And yeah, and then, and then that, that, that's where you can join this Global Shapers. And, and then uh, the World Economic Forum provides us with a lot of support uh, to us, right? So I very recently, for example, flew to Geneva and I came back. This was also part of the World mm -hmm. Economic Forum Global Shapers Summit. Okay. So they do provide a lot of help, a lot of support. And so that's what Global Shapers is, is all about. Mm -hmm. We have a presence in, I believe, almost every capital in the world. And this is a place where you travel to New York, you travel to Boston, you travel to Lagos, to Rio de Janeiro, oh, yeah. you reach out to Global Shapers and then they will show you the city, they will host you like you're Dope. their true friend. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a great communal That is a great community of incredible entrepreneurial people who try to do public good. So that's what Global Shapers is, I would say, like in a nutshell. Okay, and what did you do in the World Economic Forum? So, so was so, it like a conference or a big discussion? What was it about? Uh, when I was when I was in Geneva, yeah. So so when I was in Geneva, that was this annual curator summit, and yes, it was largely about what can we do in our hubs in our countries. Uh, to bring uh, the sustainable development goals uh, mm. to, 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 to align with the vision of the World Economic Forum and to contribute to the areas of impact that, uh, that they see. And then it was about how can they help us to contribute to that. I mean, during that conference, I met some, I don't know, I had probably the most interesting conversations I had in, I don't know, maybe years because the people were just... Marvelous. Okay, let, let me stop you for minds. a minute. Yeah. What was the most, one of the, mo I, I had this question recently. Yeah. Uh, what was the most, uh, there's somebody just, I yeah. was in a podcast myself, yeah. and they gave me this question. What was the most interesting conversation I have ever had? Ever had? Yeah. <sighs> that's a hard one to choose. Yeah, yeah, that's like really how I want to, because I was, they asked me in the moment, I was, fuck, I was so lost. Mm. And I just answered with the, one of the last conversations yeah, that I that's, had. Yeah, that's what I can say. One of the yeah. last ones. Bro. Okay, so I let's, let's we'll share. The most I'll share mine one. Let you share you. Yeah, or yeah, I'll start. Ahead. Yeah, okay? yeah, absolutely. So I was in European Youth Event in Strasbourg. It was in October. And you know European Youth Event that was in European uh, Parliament? Yes, in Parliament. Yeah, yeah, in Parliament. Yeah, it was in Parliament. And European Parliament is very accessible for handicapped people. You know, just think about it. And I thought with uh, I spoke with some, just some youngsters from Spain, who are blind, and I talked with them. And I spoke with them and just I asked them how was the infrastructure here, and they said it's terrible. They said that to go from the hotel to the event it was almost impossible. Mm -hmm. To recognize the signs, to just to maneuver uh, through the like all the event. It was also impossible. It was very hard. You needed some kind of guidance. You, it wasn't self-sustainable for them, for a blind person, to go anywhere. So, and as, as just as a healthy person, as I could, I would never thought about that. It really shifted and really, I don't know, it just it planted a seed in my, in my, in my, in my brain to more think about that, to more think about it from the other perspective, and it, I think it was very insightful just for me to look from the other side to, And I think that was one of the most interesting conversations mm. I have ever had. It wasn't the one, it wasn't, because it was the most recent, the most impactful for myself to look at the other side mm. of the world. So that would be from my side, the story. So basically something that gave you a very different perspective. Yeah, definitely. When that, you I wouldn't have thought about it, never. 
just that I thought that oh it's very accessible event everything mm. is okay they have some uh, some rails here you know the uh the, the driving of uh, rails yeah you know rails yeah yeah, yeah, yeah for for yeah, yeah from the blind person. person so they have something here so they did something here and I could never thought that, that it's not that accessible mm. for them I thought that oh everything is just designed so good for them mm. and when I'm thinking that there's a big gaps here just big gaps of the society for the other people, for the pe special people. And they're special not because they have special needs, but they're truly really special. They have, okay, they lost one sense, but they have the other six senses, which are way more better mm. than ours. And you think that's ma what makes them special. That's very deep. <laughs> that is, that is, that is truly deep. Okay, yeah, very interesting. Okay. Yeah, I told so you mine, now you show yours. <laughs> Mine. Okay. Yeah. Let me. Th okay. Th but a very, very kind of yeah, a truly insightful uh, story, and then the way you can look at at, at the other people's uh, perspective. Mine was. Hmm, I can share. Maybe I don't know if if it was the most impactful conversation in my life. But, but for me, it also wasn't the most impactful. It was the most recent. The impactful. most recent. Yeah. Maybe I would say the most recent and truly impactful was when I was in uh, Cyprus okay. recently in Lanaka. Oh, in Lanaka. And, okay. Yeah, and I've met this uh, venture capitalist, uh -huh. and uh, I just said, you know what? This is kind of my idea that I'm having. Like, I don't know, man. I should do it. I should not do it. I should. And then he just said, but you know, but what is it that like really stops you, man? Mm -hmm. I thought, I, you know, I don't know, man. Like, it's my, my idea is not really kind of that, you know, magical or isn't that innovative and is not that... He said, but do you really need an idea that is truly innovative, you know, like to, to really start doing your own business? Like, think about it. And then, and then he gave me this thought, this idea that you go simple and then you make it more complex. And he, what he said is that most companies, they start with simple and they complicate things as they go. You don't start with the most complex problem, with the most complex solution, and then you and and, and then and, and and then you move the other way around. He said an, an easier way to be to start somewhere easy, to do this. This is the part of this concept of the of this MVP, right? To do something super super simple that still has value, and then get into the flow, and the path in front of you occurs as you move, as you start taking your step one, step two, step three. Things start to becoming clearer to you. And, and, and then I thought, well, wow, this makes so much sense. This makes so much sense. So basically, to do my own business, all I have to do really is start, and then things will start flowing. And then I realized, but it was the same thing, actually, when I started to go to the gym, right? I have never did sports, so I'm 29 years old, for 28 years. Never, never, ever did I touch <laughs> anything. Ever. So I usually said to people, I, I, I love sports. Uh, watching, not, watching, not doing, yeah. So yeah, so anyway, I was so far away, as far away from sports as you can possibly be. And then I said one day, you know what, but I, I kind of want to do this. So I went to the gym and I had no idea what I'm doing. What weights I should lift, what weights I should not lift. I was doing something, probably was very stupid. And then 20 minutes later, I went home. And then... I came in the next day, same for this 20 minutes. But then I thought, okay, you know what? But maybe I can start thinking about what I do here. And then I watched one YouTube video, then another one, then another one, then another one, then another one. And then I said, you know what? But maybe 20 minutes is not enough. Maybe I should go for 30 minutes, then for 45 minutes. And then I said, okay, and now I have a very clear, structured, and great training program that I have calibrated with the multiple coaches that I'm, that I'm uh -huh. following on, on, on YouTube. And I think I have a really great training program right now. But when I started, I had nothing. I was doing some stupid things and going home, and that probably brought zero, none to zero value. But the mere fact that I started doing, that I started taking steps, the path immediately started to occur. And that's when I realized is like, I think a lot of the times, at least I was wrong in my life where I was this sort of Greek philosopher who was thinking, hmm, what's my purpose? What's my mission? What am I doing here? But instead I thought, you know what? And, and, and this actually links back to the start of our conversation. Like I have today, I have right now, and I can start doing something. And even if I don't know, I'll figure it out. I'll see what it is. And so, and, and, and I failed as great. I learned from this. So, and we and learned then, from failing. And we learned from failing. And I'll just move on. And uh -huh. so this was, it was a truly impactful conversation because it motivated me so much where I realized like, 
okay, um, if, even for even if a problem for now seems unsolvable, I can do one super small thing to move at least in that direction, and then the rest becomes clear as you start moving, as you start going, the path all of a sudden starts to appear. You never know where exactly it will lead you, but then it leads you somewhere good because you don't know where exactly, but somewhere good because you're doing good things. So I yeah. think that's this, this belief, this positivity, and this, 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 this philosophy or, of doing the small steps and living today and living right now, I think that that, that was probably the most impactful conversation that I had. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, that's very logical. Yeah, you have, you've had some very deep thoughts. <laughs> All right, thanks, <laughs> In man. this podcast, but just... Yeah, it's it's good. It's good. So it's just the one thing start, and then you will figure out the You'll things. You'll figure later. out the rest. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's move to the last question yeah, here that I ahead. have for you. Where should a young entrepreneur start? For example, what would be the best internship for internship? If you, I'm not ready for a business, mm -hmm. what would be the best internship for a young entrepreneur? Well, the thing is that you're never ready for the business. Uh, but let's say, how can but you... But let's start for one thing. If, for example, if I want to do a B2B business, I need, to, I need some experience. So what, that's just an example. But let's talk, what would be the I best internship? I would say, as, well, at least my approach, Okay. And, and, I, and I have done this throughout my entire life, right? You don't know how to do this. Meet people who know how to do this uh -huh. and learn from them. Mm -hmm. be around them, listen to their conversations, mm -hmm. work with them, make them your friends, and then, and then see what they do, how they do, and then, and then maybe together one day you'll do something, you know, and then you will learn. So I would say expose yourself to this community. Network, network, network. M bring these people to your network. Bring these people to your connections. And, and, and yeah, and then if you want to be in a specific industry, if you want to create your own startup, join a startup, do an internship, and, and yeah, and, th and then make sure that you utilize the power of personal relations, utilize the power of environment and the people that influence you so much. And, and then eventually, because I do not know your areas of improvement, but mm. as you become exposed to these people, as you become exposed to, to, to work, these areas will become obvious to you and you will start working on them. So I would say exposing yourself, taking risks, meeting people, and, and acquiring practical experience in very specific companies, that in, 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 sorry, in, in startups, I think that would be, uh, for an entrepreneur, that will be a wonderful way to start. Okay. Thank you, Hoff. It, it, it was yeah, a man. pleasure. It was a Absolutely. pleasure. I think it was one of the most, uh, I can add now to the conversations, yeah. the impactful conversations in my life. One, oh, wow. one of this. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thanks, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Bye-bye. All right.